Okay, Ben, so not the strongest um, vote of confidence for sure, right? And can you really blame Volodymyr Zelensky, who, as Richard is pointing out, has been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and now sees what must look and what is dysfunction in Washington? No, I don't think you could blame him at all. And get, bear in mind that we're not just talking about major new weapon systems. You know, in the past, there's been drama around will the U.S. provide tanks or longer range uh, rockets or F 16s. This is just about whether they can get the basic resupply of ammunition and artillery and small arms to just try to hold the front line where it already is. Russia has been able to generate a large military industrial complex to churn out that kind of material. They've also been able to turn to North Korea uh, as a reliable supplier of things like shells. Uh, and the Ukrainians are really suffering a deficit. Um, and the question in this war, as we enter the third year, is who has time on their side? And right now, in the absence of that U.S. support, and the inability of Europe uh, to kind of make up for that support, uh, it feels like time is more on Putin's side, that he has more manpower because he's the bigger population, uh, and he has more access to the arms that are relevant on the front line and is beginning to incrementally take back territory. Uh, and that's a, a very difficult circumstance for Ukraine to be in. So Zelensky says he does hope to offer a peace plan to Russia sometime this spring. Given everything you just said, is that a sign of weakness or is it a sign of strength? I think right now the problem is, uh, first of all, Vladimir Putin knows that the U.S. presidential election is in November. And if Donald Trump wins that election, it's quite likely that Ukraine is kind of permanently cut off from U.S. support and assistance and that the U.S. commitment to NATO itself uh, and those other eastern frontline allies could weaken. And so there's not a ton of incentive for Vladimir Putin to make concessions in that negotiation when he feels like he has the upper hand both on the battlefield but also in the politics of the United States and some European countries. Uh, and so I think it's responsible to pursue diplomacy. I think there always should be a door open to diplomacy when you have the kind of loss of life that we're seeing uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, there's a loss of life on the Russian side. But before the election, it feels like everybody's going to be in something of a waiting game to see where our politics goes, first with this supplemental that's stuck in Congress, uh, and then with the election coming up in November. Yeah, and there's also the disinformation campaign, right? I mentioned Russia's interference in the election here and, in frank frankly, in parliamentary elections across Europe. What do you think the lessons are, Ben, from, well, particularly 2016, when the Kremlin was able to spread misinformation on social media very effectively? I think the main lesson I take is that the Kremlin doesn't invent a lot of these conspiracy theories and narratives that travel uh, widely on U.S. social media platforms. What they do is they look for what are already divisions in the United States, what are already conspiracy theories in the United States, and they essentially go and pour gasoline on those fires. They use bots, they use troll armies to essentially amplify uh, pro-Trump, anti-Biden information, or just information that creates deep divisions in American society, particularly uh, among voters that are more inclined to support Joe Biden. So what I'd be looking for is efforts to really accelerate how that information travels. And, and really what we saw the Russians doing in the past is targeting key states, key demographics that they're focused on. Uh, I would imagine they'd look at current events, say the war in Gaza, and try to exploit divisions that are happening in the Democratic coalition around that. Those those are the types of strategies. Essentially, they're taking advantage of the sickness that is already in our information ecosystem. The only other thing I'd say, though, is that this time, it's kind of existential for Putin. He has every incentive to go all in. He's in the middle of a war that is taking tens of thousands of lives, and he knows that if Trump uh, wins the election, that his capacity to prevail in that war goes up significantly because the U.S. is going to probably cut off the Ukrainians. And so I don't know why there'd be any guardrails or any constraints on what he might be able to do. Uh, or, and that gets even more acute as we draw closer to the election. Does Russia try to spread mis- or disinformation about things like voting? Uh, do they you know, try to get more involved in disrupting the election itself? I mean, that's the thing that I think has concerned experts in the past uh, and that bears a lot of watching this time around.